My punishment, no escape is the goal. Consider the truth every day, every stroll. Consider truth when reflecting on all philosophy. Hey everyone, Dr. Silverman's back with our second spotlight lecture on Plato's Symposium. Again, the participants at the drinking party were too hungover from the previous night to once again imbibe to excess. So instead they proposed that they will make speeches in praise of love. And we got four eloquent defenses in praise of love in our first half of the symposium. Just to review very quickly, we begin with the speech of Phaedrus, who says that love was the oldest of the gods, that love generates all good things. And he says that love will make somebody a great warrior because one is willing to lay down one's life for the sake of one's beloved. Pausanias then came and challenged Phaedrus to argue there are actually two Aphrodites, a higher love and a lower love. The lower love seeks the bodily and baser needs. And this kind of love Pausanias condemns. Whereas the higher love, the lover seeks the good, the soul of the beloved and seeks to elevate himself and the beloved by way of their attachment. And this kind of love elevates the individual that is involved in the loving relationship. Next, the, in order, should have been Aristophanes, the comic playwright, but he's overtaken by a case of uncontrollable hiccups. And so instead, in his place, the scientist, the physician, Eric Zemakis, comes in with a very clinical description of love. Love for Eric Zemakis, the scientist, is nothing other than a chemical reaction, a chemical response. And the troubledness of being lovesick is one that can be healed in the way that one would heal the illness of of any living species by recalibrating by rebalancing the chemical imbalance and so again by the scientific explanation love becomes very dry and clinical but the comic playwright comes in to give us one of the most memorable speeches where he gives us a creation story that in the our original state Humans were Siamese twins, some men bonded to other men, women bonded to women, and some in which a man was bonded to a woman. And these original roly-poly individuals, these Siamese twins, became so boastful in their powers of love that they attempted to take on the gods and were punished by Zeus. They were split in half. And so Aristophanes leaves us with that beautiful image that love is the recovery of our other self, that we're soulmates that spend our lives trying to find the other half that will complete us. Agathon is next in order and begins his speech by challenging Phaedrus's view that love was the earliest of the gods, and Agathon instead argues that love is the youngest of the gods. Through love, through love. We enjoy all gatherings such as this. Through love we enjoy festivals, dances, and sacrifices. Through love there is gentleness and an end to savagery. Through love there is goodwill, for he hates ill will. Gracious and kindly he is cultivated by the wise and admired by the gods. Envied by those who do not possess him, treasured by those who do. Father of daintiness, delicacy, voluptuousness, grace, longing, and desire. Careful of good men's happiness, careless of bad men's disaster. At work or in conversation, in moments of peril or moments of desire, love is your friend and helper, your soldier and guide. Ornament of gods and men, loveliest of singers, leading mankind in songs of praise and casting a spell of song over heaven and earth. Agathon challenges Phaedrus' view that love was the oldest of the gods by suggesting love is the youngest of the gods. He gives us a very romantic view that love is so delicate that it walks on the delicate parts of the soles of the feet rather than the hard parts of the head. And then he gives us a rational attempt to explain how love makes us moral. This is a, a strange idea because we think of people being lovesick and doing crazy things for the sake of love and losing our sense of decency sometimes for the sake of love. But Agathon argues by way of each of the four cardinal virtues, the primary virtues that make up the 
system of Greek morality, that love could make one just, or that love is just, because people, when they do things out of love, that one, when one is motivated by love, one doesn't do it out of being forced to do it. One does it willingly and caringly. And, and, and likewise, he argues that love is temperate. Again, a strange notion, because one thinks of one being in love losing control but yet he argues since love is able to control the desires and the emotions that love is more powerful than the desires and in being able to control and regulate our desires it is in itself temperate and that love is courageous and here he refers back to the story the famous story recounted in homer's odyssey of the love affair between Ares and aphrodite the adulterous affair where the god Ares, the god of war is succumbed to the god aphrodite the goddess of love so that love can conquer even the god of war and then he concludes by suggesting the various ways in which love leads to wisdom. That the poet, the one who creates, and Agathon himself is a great poet, and the whole symposium itself is to celebrate Agathon's victory for the tragedy that he has written and, and that was performed and won in the festival. And he says that love is what inspires the poet to a great work of art. So Agathon, like Phaedrus, has suggested that love creates all good things. And Socrates immediately challenges Agathon. And here we see Socrates breaking the typical approach that all the other speakers have given, where they're using a pure speech, where Socrates uses his traditional method of question and answer and starts to question Agathon that isn't love a really more of an absence than the sense of possession. Do it than that. Agathon has to be demolished simply because his account of love becomes irrelevant by now. Agathon's love is a god, a splendor, a very positive, describable power. Socrates' love, my love that is, is simply a lack, a question mark if you like, a blank or a negative. Now once you think of love in this way, there's simply no point in trying to paint a picture of it. You can't paint pictures of negatives. Instead, you have to look around for appropriate things, for your quest, suitable objects to need. The idea of love is a lack of something. Socrates gives us this challenging notion that love is a lack. Well, what, what would inspire us to pursue something that's a deficiency? Socrates very famously tells us that he knows nothing. And yet, one of the few moments across all of the Platonic discourses where Socrates tells us he knows something is in the area of love. And he tells us that he learned this from the priestess Diotima. And this is interesting because here Socrates is acknowledging uh, after the women have been thrown out of the symposium that in this very m masculine dominated discourse that he learned what he knows about love from Diotima. I'll try now to give you the account of love which I once heard from a woman of Mantinea called Diotima. I had used very much the same sort of language as Agathon. I had called love a great and beautiful God. But she proved to me that since love must have an object, and that therefore love is the need of that object, and since love is love of beauty, then love is the need for beauty. Love lacks beauty. Can love be ugly? I asked. Not at all, she replied. He is not good and beautiful, but then neither is he bad and ugly. He is somewhere in between beauty and ugliness goodness and badness. He is not a god, but then neither is he a mortal. He is a spirit whose function it is to bridge the two worlds, that of the gods and that of mortals, and to prevent the universe from falling in two. Who are his parents, I asked. That's a long story, she answered. On the day of Aphrodite's birth, the gods were feasting. One of the guests was Contrivance, the son of invention. After dinner, poverty came to the door, begging. Contrivance was by this time drunk on nectar, wine not having been invented, and had gone into the gardens to lie down. And there poverty found him, 
and decided to sleep with him. That's how love was conceived on Aphrodite's birthday, the birthday of beauty. So love became the servant of beauty, she went on, and makes beauty his business. Poverty is his mother and he is always poor. Far from being sensitive and beautiful, as most people seem to think he is, he's tough and weather-beaten, shoeless and homeless. He always sleeps out in fields, on the doorstep, in the street. Like his mother, he lives in want. But his father is contrivance. Love is a text and a poacher, highly strung, resourceful and impudent. A magician who knows his art crumbs of wisdom and beauty and hoards all of them. He's a great debater and a philosopher. He is neither mortal nor immortal, she went on. Socrates recounts this story from Diotima that he learned from the priestess about the birth of love. And love is born at this by way of the relationship between Poros and Panea. He gives us the genealogy of love by way of these two conflicting forces, the, the, the wealth and poverty. And isn't that a, a faithful account of the conflicting ways in which we both feel that we're wealthy when we're in love, but also we have this need and this lack. And it's this tension between the two, the one that makes us a hunter and the other that makes us feel like we're impoverished and homeless, that motivates the individual to strive for something. It's that feeling of the sense of that one has but can't hold it forever, that leads the individual to seek to preserve it, to achieve, to strive for something beyond oneself. And ultimately, Diotima gives us the ladder of love, that all individuals achieve by way of an innate desire of their, in their mortality to strive to achieve to become immortal. And that every living species has this innate tendency the, from the lowest I I organism striving to reproduce itself, ultimately to the contemplation of beauty itself. Love is something a man should begin to practice young. First, he should fall in love with a beautiful person and with him beget beautiful thoughts. Then he should notice how beauty in one person is very like beauty in another, and learn to acknowledge that the beauty he sees in different bodies is all one and the same thing. Then he must give up this intense passion for one person, and realize the unimportance of such passion. The next stage is to realize the superiority of spiritual over physical beauty so that when he meets someone who is virtuous and ugly, he may be content with that love, and thus bring forth ideas that will improve people younger than himself. From there, he will come to see the beauty of institutions and moral practices, and to realize that all this beauty is one. Then he will indeed find physical beauty to be unimportant. From the contemplation of morals, he should move on to the contemplation of science, beauty in the widest sense. Here, gazing out on the whole ocean of beauty, from a heart overflowing with love of wisdom. Diotima's ladder gives us a way to ascend up from the lowest level of one individual being attracted to another individual, and but yet in that sense of attraction, that sense of lust, what do the two want to do? They want to raise a family and, and leave a legacy. So at the lowest level, we seek that immortality by way of our, our children, our offspring. And yet we know of a higher kind of legacy that people have left by way of political change and political institutions, the kind of legacy that people who have fought for civil rights have left a legacy that's changed people's lives, millions and millions of people's lives forever by way of fighting for justice. And the artist can leave a legacy where we continue to celebrate a Mozart or a Shakespeare or a Homer and the highest kind of a beauty that one can climb up to and the highest kind of ladder is when one leaves the realm of beautiful things to contemplate beauty itself. Now this is a strange concept. Here Diotima takes us from a world of the sensible, where we're attracted by the look and the feel and the aesthetic sense of things, 
to a, a pure philosophical contemplation of beauty itself. But what is beauty itself? The idea of beauty. Here we're back to a sense of platonic forms that have lost their physicality, that have lost their ability to be perceived by our senses. And we're in a pure, intelligible realm that only the mind's eye can see. Now, that's a very strange notion of beauty. That challenges everything that we conceive of in the typical way of art and beautiful people and beautiful things and the world of nature that touches our soul and our hearts. And yet, what do we really mean when we think of things moving us? When we stand at, at the, on our, the day of your marriage and you make a vow that in sickness and in health, right, in richer and in poor, that we love somebody and true love is not about the way they look because, of course, looks fade over the years and not just because they have a good job because, again, they may lose their job and not just when they're healthy but when they're sick on their cancer, sick with cancer on, on, in their hospital, then we still have that same sense of love for the person. And that's because the true love gets to this level of beauty itself. And so the highest kind of rung on Diatema's letter gets to the pure idea. And that takes us from the lowest level of all the various speeches that we've heard, from the lowest level that Phaedrus told us that love makes one of warriors willing to die on the battlefield, to the highest sense of the intellectual contemplation of the pure sense of beauty itself that has lost all of its sense all of its sensible and physical manifestation at this point in the dialogue where they've reached the height of the pure contemplation of beauty itself Alcibiades busts into the drinking party drunk wasted out of control and comes to celebrate in, in the final speech of the symposium, rather than this pure intellection of beauty itself, Alcibiades is given the final speech in which he gives us a eulogy to praise Socrates. Once there was a terrible frost and no one would go out of doors. Or if they did, they wrapped themselves up in all sorts of strange things and swathed their feet in felt and sheepskin. But Socrates went out with nothing on except his ordinary clothes and walked over the ice barefooted without any difficulty, while everyone else was in trouble in spite of their wrappings. The soldiers were very suspicious. They thought he was laughing at them. Here's another story. One morning he was thinking out some problem and stood still on the spot to reason it out. He couldn't solve it, but he didn't give up. He stayed there thinking. By midday, people started to notice. They were remarking to each other, Socrates has been standing there since morning. Alcibiades, the playboy, tells us that he's absolutely smitten with the ugly and old Socrates, known for his bulging flat nose and his flat face, and his, it, by, by no means was the figure of a great beauty, and yet it was something about Socrates that captivates Alcibiades and captivated a generation of young men to follow him around and to lead the examined life in the same way that Alcibiades praises Socrates in that view, in that passage, that Socrates was so taken with the idea of pursuing truth, he stood out in the cold all night long, lost in his thoughts in the way that the lovers are lost in each other's arms. So rather than praising beauty itself, Alcibiades praises this one individual who is his affection, who his object of affection that has taken his heart and soul and that has taken the Western imagination for the last 2,500 years to similarly pursue wisdom as one does the lo the, uh, a love object. We'll see everybody back soon with our next Spotlight Lecture.
of the soul, the highest state of human existence, the whole. This is why punishment, no escape is the goal. Consider the truth every day, every throw. Consider truth when reflecting on all philosophy, righteous existence, and all of human interest. Consider truth when relating what's right and wrong, temperance, what to do and how to stay strong. Consider truth when thinking about inquiry, while studying justice, authority, superiority. 